Hello there, welcome to another episode of The Trading Bell. My name is Malika Kazia. This time around, we are speaking to the Director of Strategy at Barclays Bank Kenya, that is Moses Muthui. Now, we want to ask Moses about what's happening with the rebrand from Barclays to Absa, how are things going, what are we expecting come next year, and of course, pick his brain about the economy and the repeal of the rate cap. But first, take a look at his profile. Moses Muthui is the country strategy director at Barclays Bank of Kenya, which is preparing to change its name to ABSA in the next few months. He is responsible for country strategy, investor relations and financial management for the corporate and investment banking division. Moses has over 10 years experience in banking, both locally and internationally, having previously worked for Barclays in London and New York City. Thank you so much for joining us, Moses. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Now, of course, I did mention that we're going from Barclays to ABSA. So I want to start off this conversation with that particular point because you did announce that this year, um, up to nine months to September 30th, about the transition costs to ABSA, uh, the brand from Barclays, has been about 910 million thereof. And we saw that there's a lot of transition going on there's so many activities surrounding that so first of all i want you just to tell us a little bit more about where you are uh, in terms of this transition and what else you're hoping to see come in the near future yeah no i think we are very excited to <coughs> be part of a banking group that is dominant and it's present across the african continent so you know APSA group is in 12 markets uh, it is about a thousand branches, mm. forty thousand plus employees, uh, with a balance sheet of about ninety-seven billion US dollars. And this is just to uh, provide an equivalent, uh, twice the size of the banking sector in Kenya in terms of balance sheet size. Uh, an organisation that prides itself being forward-looking. So the last three years, we've invested about fifty billion shillings on technology. Uh, we've supported two hundred thousand young people. Uh, gain a, gain a quality education mm. uh, and so we're part of a group that really speaks and leaves this continent um, what's more exciting about it is APSA group has now presence in uh, London uh, we have an office that starts operation in London and we've just gotten a license to operate in the US so we have this global reach uh, but in terms of where we are in that transition for the last uh, you know two two and a half years we've been going through this journey of rebranding and we made a very a cautious choice and a very strategic choice mm. to bring along our customers with us. So we didn't want to change the brand overnight. Of course, uh, recognizing that Barclays has been in this market for over 100 years yeah. and we had to transition that heritage, make sure that our customers come along with us and they understand the need and the reason why, why we are changing and why we are transitioning. So in terms of where we are, um, we've completed about 80% of the projects that are required to transition to ABSA. And these are technology projects where our services were housed outside Kenya, we've brought those back home. So mm -hmm. we've about, about 150, close to 150 services that we relied upon uh, Barclays PLC. About 80% of those are completely done housed here in Kenya with minimal disruption to our operations. Um, we are now on the face of beginning to change our feel and look. So you may see things start to look a little different mm. when you walk into our branches. You may, see to be, you may start to see the vibrant red colors uh, inside of our branches. Uh, and that's just to make sure that logistically we've done most of the work. So by June 2020 uh, and early parts of next year, once we now transition the brand, it's logistically not, um, not, not heavy. Uh, but what's more exciting is that we have grown at this time. We haven't uh, lost customers or lost business. Uh, we've actually got an accreditation as you know, one of the best world transition brands. Uh, and we're well on our way to make sure we land the brand safely but most importantly means something for the Kenyan economy. And we're very excited about uh, what the future holds for us. All right, yeah. so everything seems to be going in a positive direction. And we've also seen very much um, transparent transition. That's, I think, so important because you've always communicated. It's been out there and it's been a long time coming. So it's been gradual. So when are we expecting to see the complete transition? Next year, June? So, so we have until June of 2020, which is a regulatory requirement, which is the agreement between Bar uh, Barclays Group PLC and APSA Group. Okay. Um, so by that time, we would need to have transitioned completely. Uh, but as I said, what's important is we're well almost at the tail end of that process. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be sure and to be confident that by the time we get into 2020 January, there's nothing really much left for us to complete the transition. And that's where we are, we are today. Of course, it remains our choice 
by June 2020, whether it's mid, early next year, or May, or early in January. Uh, but what's important is by June 2020, you'll see the brand, the brand change. And as you rightly said, uh, we've been very transparent. And that's been very deliberate mm -hmm. because we didn't want to confuse the market. We didn't want our customers to begin to speculate. We wanted our customers to get confident with the brand, what it stands for, the products, um, the services we provide, the future strategy, uh, our investors to get confident that we have a solid strategy and a business that's growing, uh, the stock market to get confident that the stock continues to provide an upside for the, the medium and long term. So there was a whole host of things to consider. Yes. We don't leave alone the technology change and the operational change that has seen people work every single weekend for the last year to land this separation mm. on the background. So there's a lot of activity in the background to make sure we are set and ready. And I think we are much confident now going to next year that we are set and ready. And we have by June of 2020 to change the brand. Okay. So aside yeah. from now, of course, now that that's something that we're expecting to see next yeah. year completed, it's, it's exciting, of course. But even as we talk about the industry as a whole, if we, if we look at it in general, the banking industry in Kenya, we've seen a lot of um, consolidation, right. or especially this year, that's been a highlight. And um, it, it seems to be the trend almost, you know, we've seen that uh, progressing. What are your thoughts on that and, and where it's really taking the sector, especially yeah. come 2020? Yeah. So I think consolidation is really a natural progression of any financial services sector. Mm. Uh, if you've seen developed markets, uh, you have nascent banks, domestic banks growing, maturing, markets mature. There's opportunity to consolidate for a couple of reasons, and that's where Kenya is, is today. Uh, of course, you cannot have a strong economy and weak banks. We need strong banks to support a strong economy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the structure of the Kenyan economy, it can be very easily underwritten uh, or very comfortably underwritten by five to seven big banks and about 15 small niche players to provide that choice uh, and to provide that diversification. But you know, 40 odd banks for an economy of size is quite on the, on, you know, on the outlier side of, if you look at size of economies and banks that operate in economies. Yes, I think some would say we're overbanked. Uh, there are ratios to indicate that. So if you mm. look at uh, population to bank ratio, uh, it's three uh, million to one bank. Um, um, uh, in, uh, in South Africa, it's, it's 10 million to one bank. In Nigeria, it's 1 million to one bank in Kenya. So every village has a bank, <laughs> uh, so to speak. But I think what's important is to, to realize that each of the players have their own strategic motives. The people want to gain market power in Kenya mm. and outside Kenya. The people want to partner as opposed to do acquisitions, to bolt on capabilities in technology uh, and whatnot to make sure that you know, they are ready uh, for the modern day. Uh, and the people who want to grow their business organically because they believe they have the base uh, to grow their business organically. But I think you're seeing an industry uh, that is getting stronger, getting more resilient, that is open to consolidation cycles, and that's a positive thing. Uh, when banks uh, do well, economies do well. Uh, you rarely have weak banks and strong economies. Uh, you almost often have the inverse. If you look at the cases of Greece and the Eurozone, you pick lessons from there. Mm. If you look at the US, there are 6,300 odd banks, but you can only remember perhaps five or 10. That tells you there are big banks that or rather support the economy, but many niche subscale players that are regional community banks that have to exist because they serve local markets where they exist. So I think looking into the future, you're likely to, be, to see the industry continue to be more resilient. Um, of course, I'm not private to any consolidation deals that you know, are in the pipeline, but okay. what I can tell you, you know, for us as a bank, is we look at all opportunities. Mm. We're very confident where we are with our scale today uh, and the strategy we have in place. Our balance sheet has grown by 20% in 2018, double digit this year. That's the growth we want to see. So we're not out there you know, aggressively looking because we believe in what we have and we're building the business slowly and systematically alongside our strategy. But I expect to see an industry that is getting stronger and more resilient uh, than the opposite. So still on the industry, of course, like you've said, each bank perhaps has their niche and their, their tiers of banks that serve different niches. But something else that we've seen um, coming into play when it comes to access to credit is uh, mobile lending. Right. Right. So do you, do you feel like that has given more of an edge even to banks? Because a lot of banks now, of course, have that option and have jumped onto the bandwagon. But there's still those who are independent players in that market of mobile lending. So has it, has it brought a lot of competition for traditional banks? So I'd like to call it mobile finance. And here's the reason why. Because this is quite unique in this, in this country. 
you've got 52% of our GDP going through the mobile. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to the next phase of mobile finance, which is savings, financial planning, uh, broad-based insurance, micro unit trust, all these sophisticated financial products, if those come on mobile, mm -hmm. and they are, and they will, about 75% of our GDP will go through the mobile. So then you have to ask yourself as a bank whether to opt in or to stay out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you cannot not opt in if you're a financial institution that wants to serve and grow and become, be, you know, stay competitive. Yeah. So you, therefore you've seen at the back of that uh, an influx of mobile-based finance across board in banks and outside banks. Mm -hmm. um, and this phenomenon will continue. I think what's important is for each of the players, and indeed that's what we are doing you know, at Barclays, as part, uh, part of the UPSA group, is to make sure that our mobile-based finance is broad-based and beyond just lending. People mm -hmm. want to save money. Yes. People want to buy insurance. People want to transfer money. People want to pay bills. And people want to borrow. Now, these five capabilities exist in our platform, Timiza. And the direction of travel is how do we converge more services on the mobile to provide that choice and that flexibility? Because we've, we figured out that you know, the Kenyan consumer is only loyal to lifestyle, not, not to a bank, not even technology. It's yeah. what works for their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the more you converge financial services and lifestyle benefits in a mobile device for a consumer, the more competitive you are. And that's the strategy we have with Timiza over the long term. And we are well and on the way with about 4.4 4 million customers today, actually, and growing that number, providing these five predominant financial services on mobile. Uh, and we expect competition um, uh, to continue intensifying because yes. I think you know, it's no secret to any bank or any financial player in Kenya that mobile devices where financial services will converge. So how you leverage that becomes what's important. Absolutely. Yeah. On that note, we're going to take a short break. But when we come back, of course, we'll continue this discussion right here on The Trading Bell. Stay with us. <music> Talking about credit in this market, you know, right. the rate cap repeal right. is something that has been a hot topic this year. We've seen it. It was repealed after three years in operation. It came into effect in 2016. And I think a lot of people jumped on to the conclusion that, okay, now banks are going to just hike up their interest rates and it's going to be, um, you know, havoc. What, are, what would your response be to those assumptions and to those expectations that, you know, people are still suspicious that now that the rate cap is not there, we're expecting to see this soaring of yeah. interest rates yeah. come next year, even in the next few years. Right, right. So, so I think the you know, the place to start uh, this, what I'd like to call debate, mm. is, is really what is the social contract of banking. So banking exists to provide finance to the economy and to provide what you'd like to call the oxygen of commerce. So, you know, from small businesses to large corporations, to the lights, uh, to the water we take, mm -hmm. there's a financial institution behind it. And that social contract of banking works when banks can intermediate those who have money and those who don't have as much money to make sure that that contract uh, is kept. And that social contract of banking has existed for hundreds, 300 years uh, when banking began on the, formal, you know, on the formal side of it. And so as the debate went on, I think um, stakeholders broadly recognized that the rate caps were curtailing that social contract of banking. And you saw the IMF uh, and the National Treasury and other senior stakeholders rally behind the removal of this interest rate cap. Yeah. Um, it's not synonymous to increasing interest rates. I think there was, there's a realization that in the existence of interest rate caps, you can't have free pricing or free markets. Certain parts of monetary policy are curtailed. Mm -hmm. You can't deal with inflation as, as, um, as effectively as you can without the interest rate cap. So there was a lot behind the scenes that needed to be dealt for a market to be a free market from an interest rate point of view. But what's important is for us as a bank, um, we've kept our existing loans unchanged. So because the rate cap was repealed, we're not changing existing lending rates. Those will remain unchanged. That means even though new loans may be assessed differently, and we're still working through the mechanics, we haven't started really going out with any rates above, above where we are. We were during the interest rate cap. Okay. Because the existing book doesn't really change, on average, overall rates will remain at the same levels. In fact, because we believe as Barclays uh, that we have to reflect market realities, and the central bank rate has dropped, 
we have to treat our customers fairly and you may see products priced even below 13%, which was the cap. So I think what's important is just to realize that for us, we are out there, we are open for business, we are lending to small and medium enterprises unsecured up to 10 million shillings without collateral uh, at that 13% or even below. Uh, and that is what you want to see banks do more and more of. Um, and I think watch this space. You know, you'll see ourselves coming out with more innovative products um, with pricing levels that are fair, that reflect the benchmark rate, and that consider that we have to support this economy for growth. Okay, yeah. so I think one of the biggest... Um, you know, hurdles that was observed uh, because of the rate cap was the locking out of MSMEs yeah. and credit to yeah. the small and medium enterprises because it seemed that the banks were protecting themselves by, by lending to corporates, larger corporates, as well as the government. Um, and then, of course, you know, we saw that now. Do you think that the, the, the flow to SMEs is going to increase? Are you seeing that already reflected in the market? So we started, uh, as Barclays, we started to... Uh, significantly open up credit for the SME sector uh, even way before the rate cap repeal. Mm. So earlier this year, mid this year, we went out and said, you know, we're going to remove the collateral requirement if you want to borrow from us up to 10 million shillings unsecured. So that was in a realization that in a whole host of small and medium enterprises, there's demand for credit. They are good, solid businesses that provide employment. They need credit. Credit is not available, maybe on the margins, and they need credit to grow. And we went out there and said, actually, uh, we, see, we see an opportunity here to provide finance without security at low rates within the interest rate cap. And we've, we've seen quite a big flow of business from that side and quite a big demand uh, of, of, you know, of credit uh, from the SMEs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just starting towards that journey. So what I'd like to caution is, you know, credit growth is not synonymous to interest rates. I think there are other things that are, get considered. And so this is just one aspect of it. Mm. And that's why with low rates, we went out quite aggressively to lend to small businesses. And you, you will continue to see us do more of this as we transition to Absa because we've also said to ourselves strategically, if we have to be relevant to the Kenyan market as a bank on the continent, as APSA in Kenya, we've got to listen to the part that drives the economy for growth. And that's the small and medium, and medium enterprises. And there's a lot in the background towards, towards uh, making that a reality. And of course, we've, we've also heard the president talk about how majority of the businesses are under the MSME category, more than 70%. So we're looking at it from, a, from an economic perspective now, um, like you've just said. And yeah. speaking of the economy, you know, a lot of... Um, traders, a lot of people on the ground and people even in bigger corporates are right now decrying the fact that there's not much cash flow um, and there's a slump and they're feeling it, you know, it's pinching and it's, it's affecting the spending, it's affecting transactions and your ability to be able to um, have that money in your hand and be able to pay for day-to-day -day things and across the board I think a lot of people have come out and said this especially as we approach the end of the year so how would you say as a country yeah. you know we need to approach this sort of economic situation yeah so I think there's every reason to be optimistic on the medium term to long term but certainly there are short-term pressures uh, and we, we recognize those short-term pressure, pressures um, there are growth imbalances but there's also price stability so if you look at the currency, steady, stable for a prolonged period of time. Um, we don't see that falling off, you know, 104, 105 max. So that's something positive to look out for. Okay. When you look at inflation, 5 to 6%. Mm. Uh, when you look at interest rates, now a floating environment where rates are determined by market forces. Again, that will just strengthen the, the price stability. So I think on one side you have sustained price stability, which is good for business. Mm. Uh, and that is a positive upside. On the other side, though, you have growth imbalances where GDP is growing, but certain sectors are not really growing as fast. Mm -hmm. So you have this GDP number growing at your know, 5 to 6%, but social welfare is challenged. Uh, and that's mainly because of the cycle that Kenya finds itself in, like any other developing nation, where for you to advance as an economy, you must invest in infrastructure. And none of the economies I know that have been successful uh, I've invested and built infrastructure without borrowing. Mm. Now, we're in a transition phase where there has to be a payback to that debt. The structure of that debt has to slowly uh, sequence itself in a level where 
it begins to translate to economic benefits. Yeah. And that's what we find ourselves in. And that's what I say, they're short on pressures. Uh, GDP is growing because government expenditure, which is backed by infrastructure spend, is expanding. But private consumption and business investment components are not doing as well. They are contracting in certain, in certain sectors and certain segments. And that's why you hear you know, that there's not that so much trickle down. Mm. But I think it's a short-term phenomenon, just okay. because of the structure of our economy, where Kenya is in its transition as an economy, uh, and what we have to deal with short-term. But every reason to look forward to next year and the years to come uh, for medium-term stability, uh, with agriculture recovering, price stability mm -hmm. sustained, uh, and some pockets of the economy doing better than this year, the very reason to be optimistic for the medium term. So all the factors seem to be adding up and will continue to provide that optimism as well. Yeah. But even as we wrap up, um, you know, you have worked at Wall Street and that's something that a lot of people would say is amazing, something that um, a lot of people would look up to as well. So it's high octane, that environment. And when you came back to Kenya, you know, where do you see the exchange right now and for us to be able to propel even further to compete with such markets that are out there like for instance, Wall Street, yeah. and uh, for us to be able to get to that point. Of course, we've seen diversification of the NSC this, uh, this year around. We saw derivatives come in. Um, what else do you think needs to be paid attention to um, so that we can keep on the momentum? Yeah, so, so I think our capital markets are on the right path. Mm. Um, there's almost this pressure to want to benchmark ourselves with first-class financial markets and ask ourselves, why are we not there? Uh, but really the realization that financial markets take a very natural, slow, consistent evolution path mm. to get to the levels of where New York or London or Frankfurt is, uh, is what really is it's important. So you could say today the New York Stock Exchange is probably 30 years um, uh, ahead of us because mm. 30 years ago a first derivative was floated at the exchange, which is what we are doing here today. Mm -hmm. But it's because the, economy, the economics have also gone through a sustained period of evolution and complexity and uh, the market asking for capital to be provided by capital markets, not banks. You look at the US, for instance, 85% uh, of financing to the economy is from capital markets. Mm -hmm. Only 15% is from banks. It takes a period of time to link the economy from the banking system. In Kenya, it's the, over, the inverse, where 85% to 90% of this economy is financed through banks and 15% mm. through the capital markets. Uh, that delinking of banks uh, from the economy to allow for capital markets to take their space takes sustained reforms and transformation over a long period of time. What's exciting is um, Nairobi is slowly becoming the hub of the region. That's one thing that is very important, where you have regional blocks that look to one exchange not each country building its own exchange, which is akin to every airline wanting its own airport. Mm -hmm. uh, it really works that way. So the more we open the regional economy, the more we open cross-border flows, the more we allow regulation to allow more cross-listings, the more we see companies in Congo, Botswana, or, or, or Nigeria, or Uganda coming to raise capital in Kenya, and the more we allow for that framework, the more we move ahead. Uh, the London Stock Exchange is what it is because uh, they build themselves as the most global financial center where you've got anyone in Europe raising capital looks in London, not Frankfurt or Paris uh, or Madrid. Mm. Um, we just have to take our consistent path, but there's a lot of reforms required that are beyond just the exchange. Um, I think in terms of the exchange, yeah, it's quite exciting to see um, confidence coming back. Year to date, uh, the all share index up 13%. It was flat uh, a few weeks ago firstly because of the rate cap, but also because um, with interest rates coming really down in the US and in developed markets, you're seeing capital beginning to flow back to our markets. Yes. As global growth uh, recovers, you'll see more capital flowing into our markets. So next year, I think, is a likely upside than any sustained downside to our stock market. All right. Thank you so much for joining us and for all the insights. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.
And there you have it. So many insights about where Barclays is going in terms of its complete rebranding to Absa Group from Moses right there, as well as his thoughts on the economy, on the rate cap repeal. And something resounding that he said was that we're going to see a gradual shift, a gradual change. There is optimism about the economy picking right up, especially in the medium term. And of course, we'll have more conversations for you next time around, but you can keep up with us via our social media handles that are appearing on your screen. My name is Malika Kazia and I will catch you next time.